All right, so this is now the second time that I'm trying to record this lecture, and hopefully this works this time. But here we go. Um, we're going to talk about what observations we have made in the past 120 years that verify, that give credence to the idea that global warming is happening, that the climate crisis is happening. So I think we all know uh, that global warming sort of means that the globe's average temperature is warming. But this lecture is going to show you that it's actually a lot more than that, okay? That that's not the best way to describe global warming, that it doesn't always make sense to people. It's very abstract, it's difficult to understand. So this lecture is titled Global Warming a lot more than just warming. And to illustrate that, I want to call your attention to what I call the big five. The big five are five um, observations of the Earth system that um, kind of kind of show us that climate change is happening, that global warming um, is happening. The first is that the global surface temperature is rising, um, and we're going to talk about that. Second is that sea level is rising. The the height of the ocean is increasing. Uh, the third is that the summer Arctic sea ice extent is decreasing, right? And in general, the extent of Arctic sea ice is decreasing. Uh, the fourth is that uh, ice sheets and glaciers and snow in the northern hemisphere is decreasing and melting. And then the fifth is that the global average upper ocean heat content is increasing at an alarming rate, um, and I'll explain why this is a big deal. Before we get there, let's talk a bit about, review a little bit the radiation budget, right? So the radiation budget, remember, is a measure of the uh, relationship between incoming solar radiation and outgoing infrared radiation. So incoming solar radiation is in the form of shortwave um, energy. It comes in at the top of the atmosphere. Not all of it makes it down to the surface of the Earth. Remember, 30% of it is reflected. That's what's known as the albedo. On the other side of the equation, the Earth itself being a black body emits radiation um, in the form of mostly infrared radiation. That infrared radiation makes it up into the atmosphere where it is then trapped by greenhouse gases in what is known as the greenhouse effect. Some of that radiation does eventually make its way to space. Most of it gets returned back to the surface of the Earth. That's this part of the equation here. So when we add the top of the atmosphere, all of these numbers, when we take the in minus the out, we want that to equal zero. If it does not equal zero, it's out of balance and there's climate change. And right now, it does not equal zero. The greenhouse effect, right, is in increasingly getting stronger, which is reducing the amount of radiation that escapes out to space, which means that in this equation, there is less and less radiation leaving the Earth, which means that more of it is staying here in the Earth system, warming us up. The greenhouse effect, okay, just to review really quickly, is um, the effect that's caused by four distinct gases in the atmosphere, four and the end change. There are a few others that I'm not going to mention, but the four major ones are carbon dioxide, um, methane, nitrous oxide, and water vapor. And these gases in the atmosphere are very effective at absorbing infrared radiation, infrared radiation that is being emitted by the surface of the Earth. Um, as that radiation gets up into the atmosphere, it is absorbed by these gases and re-emitted in all directions, much of it making its way back down to the surface of the Earth, some of it going up out to space. So the combination of all of uh, those imbalances is what is causing climate change. And the major observation that we've observed with climate change, the major thing that we have observed with climate change is a rise in surface temperature, which is why we call it colloquially global warming. The globe is warming. This graph here shows the average global surface temperature anomaly from 1880 through 2020. What is an anomaly? An anomaly means we take a certain span of years, uh, in this case 1880 to 1920, we average the temperature of the globe together for all of those years and that becomes the normal. That's the normal baseline 
temperature. Then we look at each individual year, that's what these black dots are, and we subtract those from the normal that we've calculated. And the number that's being shown here is how far away in degrees Celsius that year's average temperature was from the normal. So you can see that in 1880 they were all very close to the normal. That's of course because we're taking 1880 to be the normal basically. Um, and then by the time you get to 2020, 2019, we're up here at about 1 or 1.2 degrees C of warming, which means that the globe has warmed about 1 to 1.2 degrees Celsius since 1880. Now what does that mean? That's a difficult and abstract concept I think to get a handle on. So I want to dive deeper into what that actually means for your experience right, with the temperature. Here's a few videos which I'll post in the, in the Discord just so that you have them as reference, but they just are news uh, clips of... Um, the, one of them is a news clip of a heat wave and the other one is um, a look at the temperatures for um, for each year average across the globe as like a, a map. And I'll, I'll show you these in the, in, the, in the Zoom when we meet there, actually. I think that'll be, that'll be a good thing to talk about there. But you can look at them ahead of time if you want to go to these uh, links. But I want to talk about this distribution. So I want to talk about what it really means that the Earth is warmed one degree Celsius. So we know that the Earth has warmed about one degree Celsius. For me, so that's like, what, two degrees Fahrenheit or so. So for me, two degrees Fahrenheit is like the difference between when I turn my heater from 70 to 72. So for me, it's difficult to perceive what two degrees of global warming actually means. So that's why I think this graph is really important. This graph shows the distribution of temperatures that can occur at any geographic location at any time on the Earth's surface. So let's take Chicago um, today, November What's the date today? The 14th? 15th, November 15th. So the average high temperature for November 15th in Chicago is about 48 degrees Fahrenheit or so, 50 degrees uh, Fahrenheit or so. So on this graph, this line here shows the distribution of possible temperatures that occurs, let's say, in Chicago on November 15th. So the average or the normal is what it sort of should be, what the climate dictates the temperature today should be, which is about 48 degrees. So that's here. So 48 degrees has the highest likelihood or probability of occurring. Meaning, of all the things, if you knew nothing about today, you would say that there's the best chance that the temperature will be 48 degrees. However, there's an equally sort of almost equally high chance that the temperature is 50 or 45 degrees because those are at the top of this curve. They still have a fairly high probability, but as we go away from this curve, for example, the probability that the temperature is 20, 20 degrees today is very low, right? It's a very low probability. It's low on this axis. Same thing with the temperature being 80 today. It's virtually impossible. It's a very low probability that the temperature is 80 today. So this is the old curve. Now, with climate change, with that shift in one degree Celsius, what that has done is it has actually moved the entire distribution towards the warmer side of the x-axis, right? Which means that the new normal here is one degree warmer, let's say, okay, or, or in Fahrenheit about two degrees warmer. So let's say the, the normal for Chicago goes from 48 to 50, okay? There's still a high probability that it will be 50 today, but the probability that it will be 80 has now increased, right? So if this, let's say this was 80 and it was virtually zero, the probability on this graph that it's 80 has now gone up significantly. So the probability on any given day that the temperature is warmer than it used to be is higher because the distribution has shifted. Now, that's not to say that it can't still be cold. It can still be cold. There is still a probability of cold weather. It's just decreased. The probability of cold weather has gone down and the probability of hot weather has gone up. That's what's happening when we see global warming. It's not that every day is one degree warmer than the last or every year is one degree Celsius warmer than the last year. That's not how this works. It means that the distribution has shifted, which means that every day has a higher probability of being warmer than it used to be. And we've actually observed this in data. So just pay attention to the graph on the left here, the northern hemisphere land temperature for the summer, for June, July, and August. And the authors of this study classified um, whether the temperatures observed in the Northern Hemisphere summer between 1900 and the year 2012, I believe, 
um, were considered hot, very hot, or extremely hot. And so you can see, I can't remember exactly which definitions they used, but it's not important because if I look at this graph, I can see that in the year 1900, about 25 to 30 percent of days um, or land area during the Northern Hemisphere summer would be considered hot. Fast forward to 2012, and it's 80 percent of days or land area is hot. Okay, so it's go it goes from 30 percent to 80 percent. For the extremely hot scenario, it goes from 0 percent in 1900 to about 10 percent in the year 2012. So this is something that we've observed. These are observations. There's no fancy modeling or anything. This is just observed temperatures. Okay, so it is true that the distributions have shifted and we can actually just look at the distribution. So again, paying attention to the bottom here, the northern hemisphere land, June, July, August temperature, anomaly distribution. So this is the same as this, but actual data. And we can see that for the 1950 to 1960 decade, the red line here, this is where the distribution lie. For the 2001 to 2011 decade, the distribution did in fact shift towards the warmer direction, right? Which means that the likelihood that temperatures were warmer than normal has absolutely increased relative to 1950. So it is in fact true that this is not just a conceptual schematic. This is something that we have absolutely observed in this very important um, paper. And we can talk about this. If you have questions about this, please bring them up in the Zoom and I can explain this in more detail. It's difficult to kind of explain this very difficult concept to my computer and just my computer. Um, so please, please bring up any questions or concerns that you have um, tomorrow in the Zoom. All right, the second of the big five is sea level rise. Um, sea level rise is something that, that we can observe using satellites or before that using tide gauge data. And so we have actually really good um, idea of how much the sea level has risen in the last, you know, 150, 200 years or so. So just looking back to the year 1900 is what this graph is showing. And we can see that if we set the year 1900 to be zero, then we have uh, in, in 1900, between 1900 and 1930, the temperature rose about, or the, sorry, the sea level rose about 0.6 millimeters per year. Um, between 1930 and 1992, sea level rose about 1.4 millimeters per year, and between 1993 and 2017, sea level rose between about 3.1 millimeters per year, okay, to about 200 or so, 180 to 200 millimeters above where it was in the year 1900. Like the temperature rise, I think that this has little meaning. You know, 180 to 200 millimeters of sea level rise is not even a foot. Um, it's difficult for me to conceptualize what a foot of sea level rise means, and so, of course, I'm going to get into it. Before I do, however, I want to review the, what causes sea level rise. And what causes sea level rise is two factors. Normally, I would ask this in class, and I think most of you would get the second one, which is that glaciers are melting, ice sheets are melting, the water that melts off of those is adding to the ocean water, and that's causing the sea level to rise. And you would be absolutely correct with that. The second factor, or in this case the first factor, is known as thermal expansion. Thermal expansion is basically warmer water takes up more volume. So the warmer the water, the more volume it takes up. And since the coastlines and the sea level, the sea floor are fixed, that water has to go up and that causes sea levels rise. So water is warming up and glaciers are melting and these two things are contributing to sea level rise. And, as I mentioned, the rate of sea level rise is increasing. So when it once, where it once was less than a millimeter per year, we're now between 3 to 3.5 millimeters per year of sea level rise. Since 1993, this means that the average sea level has risen nearly 100 millimeters, or about 4 inches. And this is the fastest rate in 3,000 years. An important point, however, is that for every vertical inch of sea level rise, this equates to several dozen to a hundred inches of inundation of ocean water inland. And I'll get to that point in a moment because that's actually really, really important. Before I do, there is this really cool mapping um, utility on a website um, which allows you to look at what 
you know, different geographical locations in the world will look like under various sea level rise scenarios. And we'll play around with this in class on the Zoom tomorrow. Um, but just to give you some examples, here is a, a look at southern Florida in a historic carbon pollution, meaning we, we don't emit anything else. How much is the sea level going to rise? And it is still going to rise because it takes a lot longer for the sea level to rise um, versus the temperature to rise, for example. And in an unchecked pollution scenario, meaning we just uh, go willy-nilly with fossil fuels and we emit as much as we possibly can, this is what South Florida would look like. So you can see that um, the Everglades, all of Miami, whatever is inundated in, the, in this unchecked pollution scenario. And in the historic carbon pollution scenario, the Everglades are gone, but Miami maybe stays somewhat intact. We can also look at London and do a similar exercise. We can see that even London floods in the unchecked pollution scenario. Coming back to the U.S., uh, we can look at this graph here, which shows the, the population, the number of people who are living less than 3.3 feet above mean uh, sea level height. The reason we choose 3.3 feet is because for all of the various scenarios that we use to predict and project the future, 3.3 um, feet, or about 1 meter of sea level rise, is the intermediate projection uh, for what's going to happen to sea level. Okay, so in a really bad case scenario, it could rise as much as six feet. And in a not so bad scenario, it could rise one and a half to two feet. So the median is about three feet or a meter of sea level rise. And so, for example, in Florida, there's a million or more people who are living within three feet of current sea level. In New York, it's up to a half a million. Louisiana, half a million to a million. Along the eastern seaboard, hundreds of thousands of people are going to be affected by um, a rise in sea level of three feet. Okay, here's another map which shows that in sort of greater detail what will inundate with one meter and six meters, which is um, a potentially really bad scenario in the next five or six hundred years. Um, and you can see that cities that are affected are the common ones that we think of all the time, like New Orleans and Miami and Tampa and Virginia Beach and even New York City and Washington DC and many others along um, the Atlantic coast and the Gulf Coast of the United States. But what's, what I really want to get at, and I want to return to that bullet point from the first slide or the second slide of sea level rise, which said that for every inch of sea level rise, you get about 100 inches of inland inundation. And this schematic shows what I'm talking about. So let's say we've got a city. Let's call it, I don't know, um, Mikaville. So Mikaville here is above sea level. Great, cool. Its citizens are thriving because it's Meekaville. Um, and so here is the, the sea level height, let's say, in 2010, according to the schematic. Now let's say that Meekaville is located on a coastline where there are hurricanes or bad storms. And you have a really bad storm which pushes the ocean inland in what is known as a storm surge. So you have a storm surge which pushes sea level um, inland. It makes sea level temporarily rise at that location. That storm surge would flood what's known as a floodplain. The floodplain is really common for all bodies of water. It's where the excess water would go in the event of a flood. In this schematic, you can see that Meekaville is still well above even the floodplain, which means that even in a bad hurricane, Meekaville is not going to flood. Now let's go to 2100. Meekaville still sits above the projected high tide due to sea level rise. Okay, so sea level has risen, let's say, three feet and Meekaville still is above sea level. Awesome, right? Wrong. Because now, when you have a really bad hurricane, that floodplain has moved even further inland, right? And how far inland it moves depends on the slope of the coastline and the elevation, right? So if you have a really gradually sloping coastline, like in, for example, Florida or North Carolina, then you're going to have a really long floodplain. It's going to go inland very far. If your coastline is a cliff, then your floodplain plain is going to be essentially non-existent. Okay, so it depends where you are, of course. Um, but let's say in this scenario, Meekaville has a very long floodplain. It's on a gradual slope, sloping coastline. So now you have a bad storm, and that bad storm floods the city. You can see that the city now sits in the floodplain. So even though the city is technically still above sea level, I don't know how many people are going to stick around in Meekaville if it floods two or three times in a year from a bad hurricane or a bad storm. At some point, people are going to throw in the towel or try to build a seawall. This is, of course, a problem because in addition to sea level rise, we know that climate change is causing hurricanes to become more numerous, longer lasting, and stronger. 
In 2020, we've had 30 hurricanes. It's a record number of hurricanes in the Atlantic Basin. Um, and not only are there a lot of them, but they're stronger and they last longer. And stronger hurricanes mean more storm surge, which, when combined with rising sea levels, threatens coastal communities like they've never been threatened before in our you know, kind of existence of living on the coast. An example of this is Hurricane Florence from a couple of years ago where the storm surge was between 2 and 12 feet. Okay, you add an additional 3 feet of sea level rise and you're now talking really far inland inundation due to a bad hurricane like Hurricane Florence or, or any other various storm that might afflict some of these locations. All right. Another country that is set to be really heavily impacted by sea level rise is Bangladesh. Bangladesh, uh, much of the country and much of the population of the country lives in the delta of the Ganges River. Um, so very close to sea level and a one meter or three foot rise in sea level would flood 20% of the geographical area of Bangladesh, including parts of its capital city, and would also displace up to 15 million people. When these people are displaced, where are they going to go? They're going to maybe move somewhere within Bangladesh, or they might move out of Bangladesh to, for example, India, the neighboring country. This creates a geopolitical situation, okay? Um, you've got all these people who've got to go somewhere. Um, so you have geopolitics involved, you have economies involved, right? You have migration involved and displacement. So these are all important considerations for how climate change, specifically sea level rise, is going to destabilize the geopolitical environment in some regions of the world and within some countries, right? So, for example, after Hurricane Katrina, you had a big exodus of people out of New Orleans to, for example, Houston. That's changed the geopolitics of the South. Globally, uh, there are estimates that between 200 and up to half a billion people would be displaced by sea level rise or require very fancy and expensive um, and logistically difficult to build seawalls. Other places that are set to lose uh, in the you know sort of the, the the fight against sea level rise are uh, Pacific Island nations. So already eight low-lying Pacific islands have been swallowed by rising sea levels, and some island nations will be completely wiped off the map. Will no longer exist. Will be underwater with one meter of sea level rise. Literally gone. Wiped off the map. The country. The entire country. Gone. And one of those countries, of course, is sort of a poster child for, for sea level rise and the effects of sea level rise, and that is Tuvalu. So Tuvalu is a Pacific Island nation, which has been flooding for the, you know, as long as climate change has been going on, and has suffered tremendously, and has been very outspoken about the losses that it has experienced, and is very explicit in its blame of the United States for those losses. So I'll read this quote by a Tuvaluan government official about referencing the U.S.'s inaction on Kyoto, which is the pre-pre-pre-Paris Agreement, uh, which Bush and company never ratified. So by refusing to ratify the Kyoto Protocol, the U.S. has effectively denied future generations of Tuvaluans their fundamental freedom to live where our ancestors have lived for thousands of years. Okay, so moving on from sea level to Arctic sea ice now. Arctic sea ice, of course, is another really alarming sort of observation that we've had during the climate crisis that kind of points to evidence that the climate crisis is a thing that's happening that, that, that we need to address. Um, of course, the charismatic megafauna, the polar bear, um, has come to represent the decline in Arctic sea ice. Um, and stands to lose tremendously as Arctic sea ice declines, but they're not the, the only ones, as I'll, as I'll talk about in the next few slides. So just looking at, kind of pulling out at the big picture, the Arctic, which is an ocean uh, at the top of the world, every winter the sun turns off because of the slant, the tilt of the earth. Um, the sun turns off, it goes away, it's dark. It gets very cold. The Arctic sea ice grows and grows and grows and grows and grows until, you know, basically takes up the whole Arctic Ocean. Then in the spring, the sun comes back to the Arctic, temperatures warm above freezing, and Arctic ice melts until it reaches a low point in September, late September. So you reach a low point in late September, you reach a high point in late April. This graph is showing that annual cycle with an increase during the winter and a decrease during the summer, and it's also showing how it's changed for every year that we've had satellite observations from the 1980s through to uh, this graph goes through 2019, but I could update it through 2020. I'll try and do that before 
tomorrow. And what you can see is that in 1980, for example, the maximum extent of Arctic sea ice in the winter was about 33,000 cubic kilometers, the volume. And in the summer, the low was about 18 or so thousand cubic kilometers. Fast forward to 2019 or 2020 or any of the various years in the 2010s, and we see that the maximum extent was about 21,000 cubic kilometers. So the volume of ice in 2019 at its maximum point in the winter, after freezing all winter, was only about 3,000 cubic kilometers more than the minimum extent or volume of ice in the 1980s. That's a really, really important distinction um, because now the minimum is really close to zero, which means we're getting to a point where the summer may not actually have any ice in the Arctic at all. It might all melt. So it used to not all melt, right? It used to be uh, melt 50% of it or so it would melt. But now, if the maximum extent is 50% less than it used to be, then you're eventually going to get to a point where you have nothing left in the summer. We can zoom out even further and look at each year's mean annual Arctic sea ice extent, and it's very clearly been declining since 1979, since we first had a satellite. So you can see that it's declined from about 12.5 million square kilometers to about 10 million square kilometers um, in 2018. This is extent. This is different than volume, and I'll talk about the difference in a couple of slides. This decline pairs perfectly with this increase in Arctic temperatures. So as Arctic temperatures go up, sea ice goes down. The relationship isn't actually one-to-one, -one, however, because as, Arctic, as the Arctic temperature goes up, that melts the ice. As the ice melts, it exposes what used to be a white ice surface is now a dark ocean surface. That dark ocean surface is really good at absorbing sunlight. It absorbs sunlight, gets warmer, and warms the air even more. Now you've got even warmer air, which is going to melt the ice even more, and you can see how this is a multiplicative process. It's a positive feedback. Warm air melts more ice, exposes dark ocean, warms the air even more, melts even more ice, and it continues ad infinitum, right? So that's a positive feedback, which is why the global temperature has increased about 1 degree Celsius, but the Arctic temperature has increased 2 to 5 degrees Celsius, sorry, 3 to 5 degrees Celsius in the last, you know, 120 or so years, okay? So almost three to four times faster increase in Arctic temperature than the globe as a whole. And that has probably a lot to do with the Arctic sea ice feedback. And you can see that it is true. In fact, each year we see, on average, the minimum ice extent decreasing every year. So 2012 was actually the record low Arctic sea ice extent. 2020 was actually came in second. There will be a year, maybe it's 2021, maybe it's 22, when we will pass 2012. Then there will be another year, maybe 2025, when we pass 2021, etc., 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 until we get to a point where we have no ice left in the summer. In addition to the ice melting in the summer, this is not just a summertime problem, it's also a wintertime problem. So Arctic temperatures now in the winter are increasing, whereas they weren't increasing as dramatically before, they are increasing very dramatically now. And we can look at the temperature record from Uchiavik, which is formerly known as Barrow, Alaska. At the very top of Alaska, at the Arctic Circle, you can see that for much of the 1900s, the temperature was very fairly flat in the winter time. Okay, so this is the November to March mean temperature. But in the last 20 to 40 years or so, 20 to 30 years or so, the temperature has increased really dramatically, like 15 degrees Fahrenheit in Uchiavik, at the, at the Arctic Circle, in the winter. Okay, And this graph here shows the average for the whole Arctic during 2018. You can see that during 2018 there were periods in February and March where the average air temperature for the entire Arctic okay, was about minus 10, minus 15 degrees Celsius, which is normally the average air temperature in mid-May, okay, for the Arctic. And this is in the depths of winter when there's no sun. So what this is causing is for the maximum in Arctic sea ice extent to decrease as well. So not only is the minimum in September going down, but the maximum is going down. And when you have 
uh, less, um, hmm, did I? When you have less Arctic ice in the winter, okay, you have less Arctic ice to melt in the summer, which means you end up with even less Arctic ice in the summer. And then to regrow that in the winter is a huge task. So what we're ending up with is thinner, younger Arctic sea ice, okay? Because normally, Arctic sea ice would last through the summer. Some of it would last through the summer, and then you would build more on top of it. So you'd have multi-year Arctic ice, right? Five-plus-year Arctic ice. Now, you basically have all your Arctic ice is one or two years old, which makes it really easy to melt it in the summer. Okay, so we are going to have that one summer where there's a you know, three-week-long heat wave, and it's going to melt all the Arctic sea ice, and we're all going to pretend to be shocked when there's no ice in the Arctic, but we're going to also have been saying for years and years and years that we've been warning you this day is going to come. Okay, so this is, this is the observation. One final piece to this, which is really troubling to me as a climate scientist, is that we don't really know how to model Arctic sea ice. So we think we, um, we can model Arctic sea ice extent, but unfortunately the observations are outpacing even our best modeled estimates. So this black line here is the average of all of the climate models, what they think is going to happen to the sea ice extent in the Arctic, right? So from beginning in 1900, this black line shows the average of all those models through 2100. The red here are the observations, what we've actually observed during that time period. And you can see that for a while they match the model, but beginning in, let's say, 1970, 1980, they've really precipitously dropped to below even the most extreme model scenarios. So now not only is our model not capturing the rate at which ice is declining, but even the most extreme models are not. So we're having to recalibrate some of our ice, uh, Arctic sea ice models to better capture this. The alarming thing uh, that comes of this, the alarming conclusion that comes from this is that we will probably get to a point where we have no Arctic sea ice in the summer. And that point may happen as soon as 2050, where we get basically to zero. I think anything less than 1 million square kilometers is like, for all intents and purposes, considered zero. All right, so we have uh, temperatures, we have sea level rise, we have Arctic sea ice, all of these are problems. We've also got northern hemisphere snow and ice cover extent decreasing. Okay? And the best way, I think, to look at this is to compare photos of glaciers from 100 years ago to now. So uh, I start with this photo because it's really striking to me. This is taken in the exact same location. You can actually see this hump of a mountain in the back here and the same mountain here. This is the glacier in between this ridge and this ridge. The glacier here comes down, 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 down and empties into this glacial lake. In 1890, you can see that the ice from that glacier was in the glacial lake where they were taking this picture from. But by 2005, not only is there no ice in the lake, but the glacier has receded all the way up the mountain, basically all the way up the mountain. So very clearly, you don't need any data. You can just look at these pictures, which could count as data, actually, um, and say it's very obvious that this glacier has lost ice mass. And that's because more ice is melting than is being added. Here's another example of the Shepherd Glacier in Glacier National Park. Between 1913, you can see the glacier here, and 2005, the glacier has all but melted and disappeared. Even in the tropics, tropical glaciers on the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. In 1912, there were permanent snows on the top of Kilimanjaro. By 2002, there were virtually none, and by now, there is no permanent snow on the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, um, except maybe at the very tippity-tippity top. Um, right at the right at the right at the top. Um, what's it called? The summit, um, right? And so you can see that the the total amount of ice at the top of Kilimanjaro, um, which is a tropical glacier in Africa, um, is basically virtually zero at this point. It has melted all the way down um, to zero. Here are some more pictures um, of of northern hemisphere um, glaciers. You can see here in 1930, this glacier was emptying into this glacial lake, you can't even actually see the glacier back here, but if I fast forward to 2005, I can see the glacier here, which was formerly emptying into this lake. Not only is this not a lake anymore, but it looks like a swampy field. So the glacier has melted so far back that it's not even melting into and forming a lake. 
where it once was before. Same with this glacier in 1941. You can see the leading edge of the glacier emptying into this lake. The leading edge now in 2004 in this photo is out of the frame. You can actually see where the former edge was uh, right here. So, um, I do have this really cool video uh, to show about melting glaciers in Glacier National Park, but I will save that again for the Zoom tomorrow um, because I don't want to have copyright issues with YouTube. But this is a great video, and, and so please um, either look at it ahead of time or I will show it in the Zoom tomorrow. There are two big glaciers, which we actually call ice sheets, which take up entire continents or entire islands. And one of those is Greenland, and one of those is Antarctica. So Antarctica is a continent, and it's covered with ice. Greenland is an island, and that is also um, entirely covered with ice. And so we don't call those glaciers. We call those ice sheets. And both of those ice sheets have lost significant mass of ice, um, even in this graph since just 2000 and, I believe, 2. Okay, so you can see Greenland in the red, Antarctica in the blue. Antarctica has last, lost a little bit less um, ice mass. And if you want to know why, write that question down and ask me tomorrow, and I will explain to you why Antarctica has lost less ice mass than Greenland has. Um, but, the, but Greenland is melting very quickly. Um, and if both of these melt, they would add a lot of water to the ocean, which would significantly raise um, the sea level. Additionally, for all of the North American glaciers, um, we've seen that every single major North American glacier has lost ice mass. Um, pretty obvious, some more than others. Oops. And also, um, just to add on top of that, there, the reason that these glaciers are declining is because they're melting due to climate change, and also due to climate change, new snow is not falling on top fast enough to make up what's melting. And this is also because snowfall in the Northern Hemisphere is decreasing overall. Snow extent has decreased significantly, and this is contributing to the loss of ice in glaciers. Okay, so we've got temperatures, we've got sea level rise, we've got Arctic sea ice, we've got uh, glaciers and snow. Finally, I just want to talk briefly about global ocean heat content. So water, water, is incredibly good, incredibly effective at absorbing heat. It has a very high heat capacity, which means that much of the warming from global warming is actually going into the ocean and being absorbed by the ocean and increasing the ocean heat content um, across the globe, right? So this graph here shows the heat content of the surface ocean, 0 to 2,000 meters, and you can see that it has gone up, let's see, let's do the math, from negative 10 to 25, so about 30 to 35 times 10 to the 22 joules. That's a lot of energy that has gone into the ocean. In fact, if we pull out and we look at all of the excess heating from climate change, 90% of all the excess heat, of all the excess watts per meter squared, from that radiation imbalance, 90% of that heat has gone into the ocean water. Okay, that's what's shown here. All of this blue is heat that's been absorbed by the oceans. The red is heat that's been absorbed by the land and the atmosphere. So this is the warming that we've sort of experienced um, in, our, in our bodies with the, with the rising temperatures. The blue is the heat from the global ocean heat content. And this isn't isolated to, to one ocean across the globe. It's all the oceans. The Southern Ocean is really doing a lot of the work. There's a lot of heat that's being absorbed by the Southern Ocean, but also the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. They're all absorbing excess heat content. Okay, so that ends the first part of this, which are sort of the observations of what I would call 20th century climate change. The next lecture will be on what we expect to happen in the future. All right, so hopefully you've got lots of questions. We've got lots to talk about tomorrow in the Zoom, and I will see you then.